So good evening, Professor Marathi. Welcome. Uh, this is the first of many interviews we're doing with uh, leading academics in the U.S. Uh, talking about AI curriculum and workforce development. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to start by asking you to give us a little brief introduction about yourself, where you are and your background, and then we'll start with some more formal questions about uh, training and capacity building in AI. So over to you, Thank you Professor Marathi. Thank you very much, Nandini and, and your colleagues. Uh, let me give you a brief introduction about myself. Uh, I'm Madhav Marathi. I'm a distinguished professor in biocomplexity here at uh, University of Virginia. I'm the division director of the Networks, System Science, and Advanced Computing Division within the Institute, as well as a professor in the Computer Science Department. Uh, uh, I've been at University of Virginia for the last three years. I have held positions at Virginia Tech before that, uh, and uh, also at Los Alamos National Laboratory, where I was for 11 years working on complex systems problem. My broad areas of interest are in, in really understanding uh, large-scale complex systems. And one of the things that I have been uh, very passionate about is to do transdisciplinary team science. Uh, so that they break the, you know, in, in my opinion, somewhat artificial boundaries that depart, uh, departments and, and, and topics uh, introduce. Uh, and we'll have a chance to talk about it more, but hopefully this will be a, a, a brief background about myself. Great, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, so I'll start with my first question. Uh, so we're looking at AI or AI related graduate and doctoral programs, and we're defining uh, these rather broadly using some of the standard NSF or NIH definitions. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about what the University of Virginia offers in terms of graduate or doctoral level programs in AI or related areas? Uh, tell us a little bit about what's unique about the programs. You did talk a little bit about transdisciplinary research. Uh, so is that part of the curriculum? And what's the size of your faculty and uh, why is the program at UVA uh, unique or different from some of the other programs you see across the U.S.? Sure. So I'll, I'll try to do justice to the work my colleagues are doing. Of course, okay. um, a number of uh, folks are doing really outstanding work on the campus. So my sense is that about 40 to 60 faculty members across the campus are engaged in one form of or other of research that I would say pertains to AI. You know, it's a broad topic. The topics definition has also changed over time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think this would be a fairly good estimate of how many people are right now involved. Uh, UVA is unique because it has got three very strong schools, uh, the School of Medicine, the School of Law, and the School of Business. They are much more, uh, I would say, uh, schools that train people in, 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 the, in the real world on one side. And then there is very strong school of college of arts and sciences mm -hmm. and the engineering school. What it does, it allows us to work as a faculty on problems that cut across disciplines very, very well. So the law school, the business school, uh, the medicine school of medicine provides us wonderful real life applications mm -hmm. where you know, ideas from statistics, engineering, mathematics could be fruitfully applied. Um, <clears throat> so that's one unique aspect, in my opinion, about what uh, this university has to offer. The second is their desire uh, in doing this multidisciplinary F work is manifested in two, two concrete examples. One is our own institute, the Biocomplexity Institute and Initiative, as it's called and was established three years back with the explicit goal of trying to work on problems that cannot be solved by looking at them in silos, even within a single school. And so uh, we are situated not within a single school, but across schools. And I, I put this through because I think sometimes you need these you know, a nodal organization that can pull expertise together. Uh, the second interesting example is recent establishment of School of Data Science. And um, that's a new school. It's a topical area that interests a lot of folks. And that particular school has decided to not even have departments within the school at this point. <clears throat> they strongly believe that they would like to do this uh, without having specific departments. They'll have divisions where people interact with each other. 
And that school is going to work a lot on AI-related problems. And many of the faculty members actually are hired with joint appointments across other schools as well. Mm-hmm. So that gives you a sense of why this multidisciplinary aspect is important in AI, as we all know. Um, I think it provides very interesting ways for people to collaborate. To your other question, um, so I think I've answered the question on size, mm-hmm. uh, what makes the program unique. Yes. Um, in terms of uh, other programs, so the Department of Computer Science and Electrical Engineering both have modules that are AI related. They have mm-hmm. been very aggressive in hiring computer science faculty members who have interest in AI folks from cyber physical systems Mm -hmm. uh, to AI in health, to natural language processing, cybersecurity, Mm -hmm. wireless networks are all examples of kinds of things people are starting to use AI techniques in. We are also working on topical areas that have to relate relate to material science, for instance, in robotics, Mm -hmm. which are interesting applications of AI. So I would say those are broadly speaking the the uh, elements of the question that you just posed for me. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much. So what do you see as key research areas, both from a foundational perspective, so more theoretical questions in AI or data science, uh, as well as sort of emerging applications? You did bring up material science, but uh, since your institution has uh, a very strong medical school, and you talked about the law and the business school. Where do you see new applications of AI emerging? Absolutely. I, uh, let me try and break this into, say, three parts uh, and tell me whether this sort of helps. Uh, let me first talk about uh, a class of applications that I think are interesting. Again, <clears throat> I'm sure others will cover other applications mm-hmm. too, so I'll speak to the applications that uh, I have worked in, I have a very good sense of, and uh, hopefully between all the speakers, you'll cover a range. So I think emerging applications that we have a lot of interest and expertise in, first is uh, public health epidemiology. Now, two years back, I had to convince people that AI has a role in pandemics and epidemics, but I think that that part is done for me, uh, luckily. Um, the second topical area that uh, uh, is of interest to us uh, is agriculture. We just uh, were funded uh, by the NSF and NIFA on the AI Ag Institute that is being led by uh, WSU. Uh, mm-hmm. but I think it's an important topical area where I think AI can be fully applied to topics in agriculture. Questions related to pest management, questions related to, you know, how to plant crops, managing water, uh, understanding the differences between you know, impact of weather on, on these crops. Uh, all of these questions can be viewed from the lens of AI. Uh, third topical area is urban science, uh, which broadly includes, of course, these aspects. But I think with the climate change, our whole understanding of urban science becomes interesting. In fact, Nandini, I think uh, the term I have tried to coin, uh, mm-hmm. Sort of talking about urban and rural is really the term which I would call social habitats. Uh, I think uh, that really captures and really takes away this distinction because I think in talking about urban science, often we neglect the rural communities. But as you very well know, in India and in the US, uh, rural communities are very, very important. In fact, this desire to move into urban centers is potentially a, a large challenge that both the governments potentially face. So I would rather call this social habitats mm-hmm. and think about sustainable social habitats as a topical area rather than just doing urban regions. Um, so that's the, on the application side. On the mm-hmm. foundation side, I think there are just really amazingly interesting ideas that are starting to develop. One is privacy. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's differential privacy, but there's also other ways to to take care of privacy. And AI offers potentially new solutions. Uh, we have been, you know, your background is in statistics, I know. Right. Uh, I used to be at Los Alamos, which is one of the finest applied statistics group. And we had thought about privacy when we build our digital twins for cities and regions and done it in a way that really takes care of it in a rather interesting way. The other foundational topic is one that has to do with federated learning. Mm-hmm. I bring it up again because, you know, for all the talk about lots of data we have, Mm-hmm. In other ways, we don't have enough data to work with in many of the AI applications. Mm-hmm. 
And then the other two related aspects of our, our stochastic optimization, uh, network science, transfer learning, and, and questions related to fairness, bias, and equity. All these are, I think, interesting questions that we need to, to address. And finally, on the engineering side, um, I would bring up issues to talk about data-driven modeling, because I think oftentimes people build conceptual models, but they don't connect it to the ground data. The second part that I would like to bring up there is the idea of end-to-end -end modeling. And my colleague, Milin Tambe is trying to you know, popularize this area as well, mm -hmm. because he's trying to deploy these applications. And you find that deploy data, you know, collecting data to building models to deploying it and taking it back to collecting the right data is actually the real challenge rather than mm -hmm. just building endless models for it. Right. And, the, and the third part is what I call operational AI. Uh, not just again building it, but putting AI to use in real world. So hopefully that gives you a, a broad sense of applications, topical areas and foundations and topical mm -hmm. areas, which I would call engineering principles. Wonderful. Uh, I noticed you didn't talk about complex systems, but we have a Nobel I, Prize most recently in uh, the theory of complex systems. I, I would, yes, I, you know, that's my personal interest and I'm trying to, uh, uh, you know, but I view agriculture, I view pandemics, I view uh, social habitat modeling, mm -hmm. sustainable systems as all examples of socio-technical complex systems. Yeah. And in, in that sense, AI is, is really central to that, in, in mm -hmm. my opinion. So, um, and that's why I use the word network science here, uh, right. because I think one of the things that we have a chance to do as a, maybe, and I'll have a somewhat biased view as a computer scientist is, uh, physics has always studied large scale systems, but they have mm -hmm. been able to come up with ways to compress a system using you know, various techniques and build lumped models, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or aggregate models. And they work quite well. They work quite well because of inherent symmetries in the system and, you know, very nice physical laws. When you study socio-technical system, this is still an open challenge. How do you take a big system and sort of compress it down? Because we don't have the luxury of, of um, understanding the, the physics of it, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that makes the problems very, very challenging to work with and remain a really interesting open question in, in, in a certain sense. So I view the class of systems we study are what we call mesoscopic systems. They're not mm -hmm. as small as 10 to the 2 or 10 to the 3 elements, agents, or nodes. Mm -hmm. And they're not as big as Avogadro's number, yeah. where you can then do normalization and, and mm -hmm. basically build lumped models. They're somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. And the network structure or the interaction structure is a is a first class object in some way. You cannot do away with it easily. Mm -hmm. At least we have not learned how to do away with it easily. So absolutely, that's a topical area. Um, you know, the Nobel Prize this year acknowledges mm -hmm. this, yeah. and hopefully that won't be the last last of it, in my opinion, in the in the coming decades. Uh, fascinating. Thank you for that. Um, so in terms of the program, uh, so you've talked about the program at UVA and uh, some of the interesting research areas. What aspects of the program do you think are doing well and what do you see as challenges and barriers? Uh, either it could be infrastructure, you know, resources. Uh, what do you see as the challenges? And I think uh, what we're trying to do is also uh, see across the board in the US and India, uh, what are the sort of tipping points? Right. I think it's, first of all, it's a great question. Um, so what is doing well? I think mm -hmm. uh, industries, especially large IT companies have embraced AI yeah, big time. Mm -hmm. uh, from what I understand, um, you know, we have always heard of Google as working on, on the algorithms that the founders developed in terms of search. Mm -hmm. But today, all the search is largely driven by deep learning methods. Mm -hmm. uh, and so deep learning methods have done remarkably well, but then is also the challenge. I think the, the, there is clearly a hype about using neural networks for solving everything. Mm -hmm. I feel at some point we will hit a wall. Um, another question is when, and not because that methods are not useful. They, they do have their limitations. And uh, I think one needs to acknowledge it. Uh, we actually had a similar run up 
in 1980s too. And then we found that we could only go so far. And the same thing is likely to happen, in my opinion, here. But deep learning methods are doing very well at this point of time. Uh, IT companies have taken up uh, AI very well. I think in the next phase, other com- manufacturing companies and uh, you know supply chain companies and logistic companies, uh, services are also going to embrace AI in, a, in much the same way that typical IT companies have done. And they're rediscovering themselves in, in the process. Uh, what else has done well? I think uh, it, has da- it has been become much more clear that this forces people to come up with ways to collect data, at least the realization that we need data to drive many of our models, measurements are needed, that has happened. Mm -hmm. On the challenge side, I think there are technical challenges, of course. One I mentioned already, the lack of data, the biases and fairness aspects that AI can bring in, Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, a real challenge. Uh, I don't think so they can be solved uh, anytime soon, this is a quite uh, issue that has to be dealt with for a while, which means that people need to be careful, in my opinion, in how uh, it can be done. Uh, another place is uh, where I see challenges is uh, use of AI in what I call mission critical systems, uh, including uh, defense. Um, you know, I think uh, it's a it's a question that has to be thought through very very carefully. You know, there are lots of mission critical systems. We do end up using AI unknowingly, but the, that part I think so has to be dealt with very, very carefully. And something I, that would be a mat, you know a great question for the two countries to work together uh, as we go along, because there's a there's an allure to it, right? The, you can use autonomous systems in one form or other mm-hmm. in all sorts of applications, but one has to be thoughtful about it as well. So, so autonomy is a, is a world, and maybe to make the things sort of the challenging on the other side, I'll call this weaponization of AI. As much as there's good side to AI, much like every technology, it's a two-sided uh, issue. Uh, people can use it and misuse it. Uh, often misuse always dominates the good mm-hmm. use. Uh, somehow people seem to figure out and we need to build out robust systems that misuse can be stopped. On a, on a more general set of challenges, I think two that I think are important. One, I do feel uh, in my interactions with folks in India that while India has a lot of potential, we have very thin set of expertise at top. The, I think there's a huge need in India to develop uh, a workforce that is able to take these new technologies and adapt, adapt uh, them into their, into their work culture. Um, the second part I feel, and this is, I think, true for U.S. as well, uh, is the concept of transdisciplinary science. There's a, you know, in general, people get siloed into areas. They say, oh, I'm a mathematician, so I'll do it this way. I'm a statistician, I'll do it this way. I'm a computer scientist. But I think interesting problems almost always arise at the boundaries of these things, at the intersection of these points. How to develop innovative courses where you have the strength and training, uh, but in each, in one or more of these disciplines, but also have the ability to work across. So the concept of pie shape training has brought, been brought up. It was T shaped, now it's pie shape. Right. Maybe you know you'll have a centipede if you want to have you know, a <laughs> number of Any. steps. Yeah, but the point remains that one needs to understand this, and uh, you know, early 1700s people used to know multiple areas and were able to integrate. Science became probably more advanced, so people started specializing, but we need to go back to this generalization as well. And I think if we don't do it, we are likely to miss out on ideas and and, and maybe rediscover them over and over again. So hopefully that gives you some some sense of my view on what challenges are. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, another challenge, which I think I'll frame in the form of question, um, AI is now very popular. I mean, everybody wants to take courses in AI or get a degree in AI. How do you, in, at UVA or at other institutions you're familiar with, how do you encourage, motivate graduate students, maybe master's students to stay on and do a PhD? Uh, how do you convince them encourage them to pursue a career in research? Because even if they finish a PhD, uh, they're the Googles and uh, you know other tech companies just waiting. Uh, so how do you yeah, get so people into so more very research? Much, very good question. And then, uh, as a personal anecdote, 
when I came to US um, from IIT Madras, that's where I did my undergraduate, mm. 18 of us at least started with enrolling for a PhD program out of 27 in my batch. Today, my professors tell me that, uh, first of all, the batch size has grown, but very, very few students from IIT, and this probably applies way below, mm -hmm. so I'm just speaking IIT because I've been in touch with them. Very few students want to do a PhD from India. Um, you know, startup culture is strong, which is good in some ways, but uh, certainly doesn't pull people towards research. Um, there is also uh, the incentive of quickly making money in, in, in mm. these companies, as you point out, it becomes very hard. We're seeing this in US too. Mm. And in many ways, my view is that big schools are still doing okay because um, they, they're attracting uh, folks. But I would say UE is a very good school, but not uh, necessarily in that, you know, the absolute top tier in, in at least in AI right now. And that makes it challenging to attract students uh, in, in a certain sense, uh, because I think the, the la on one hand, there's a lot of interest, but the interest is either at the bachelor's level or the master's level going beyond, as you point out, is not there. So what sort of incentives can we have? I think first and foremost, and I think you being at NSF have seen this, I think when I've talked to my graduate students, so it's anecdotal, mm -hmm. they see faculty members writing grants all the time, trying and you know, uh, trying to essentially keep the group afloat. And they think, you know, is this really worth it? Uh, you know, so the, the incentive to be a faculty member or researcher in an academic setting or a research mm -hmm. lab setting uh, was one of stability and one of, being able to do something which is interesting and they could trade off money with, with it to some extent. The money side has become so strong while, while you know, the in uncertainty on the other side has gotten mm -hmm. that part weaker, that the balance has clearly moved into that direction. My hope is over time we, we try to fix the balance because in the end, if we don't have research, mm -hmm. um, you know, we will, we will stop. Now, good news is, AI does require data in many cases, as we discussed, and big companies like Google, Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, Facebook, for all the you know challenges they're facing currently, do have data. So figuring out how to unlock that data mm -hmm. in a manner that is you know does not spoil privacy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, takes care of privacy issues, but makes it open to individuals will, is another way that people might be incentivized. So some of my colleagues who have gone on to say you know, one of these IT companies say, you know, mother, I would like to do this. First, of course, the money is, is an incentive, but at the end, I can really do cutting edge research in, in these companies because availability of data and even my co the co colleagues exist that I can work with. That clearly is missing. The analogy is that, you know, if you want to do physics and you don't have a linear accelerator, certain kinds of physics you just can't do. So, so the the non-availability of large machines or data that these big companies have uh, is another another problem that uh, agencies have to sort out. So that's the infrastructure challenge you talked about. Mm -hmm. I think both countries need to figure out how can they build infrastructure where access to machines, access to data is is made available to a large swath mm -hmm. of folks from the very early on. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my next question is going to pivot a little. Uh, you've already talked about um, industry and, you know, how uh, many of these IT companies and tech companies are sort of investing heavily in AI. Uh, does your institution have any partnerships with industry and businesses, uh, any specific areas? And where do you see in the future a huge demand for AI or AI professionals? Uh, which sort of sectors? Uh, you've mentioned a few, but uh, maybe there are others. Right. So um, over the years, we have worked with a number of uh, different organizations, commercial organizations. We work with Google. Uh, we have a strong partnership with them. Um, the university uh, and the department uh, faculty members do have partnership with other other groups as well. Um, you know, various companies uh, do come to the campus and have, I would say, bilateral relationship between one or two faculty members and others. Some faculty members have gone on and opened their own startups. And in, in that sense, they have developed a relationship with the commercial side. On the Indian side, we actually work with a company called Persistent Systems. And we have also had discussions in the past with TCS, 
mm-hmm. um, you know, among the Indian sort of companies themselves. Um, I think that um, there is a lot of interest, but again, there are some challenges that I would call out on two challenges. From um, industrial side, they like for faculty members to come and work at their, you know, in in the in the company. Mm-hmm. But a model that allows the faculty members to retain their faculty positions and still contribute to the industry in a meaningful way is is something that is evolving. There have been a few models where people work for a few days at the at the academic institution or their home institution and spend a few days in a company, but that model has its strengths and weaknesses, but it's a model that people have started. There are, of course, sabbatical-based models that people do, but we need those interactions more and more before we can we can have stronger partnerships, which is absolutely needed. Um, second is to just directly fund uh, an academic group. Companies don't seem to like it as much uh, mm-hmm. as they used to in the past. They feel that that doesn't... Uh, help them direct the research in the direction that they really want. So I think uh, the ongoing discussion I know at various agencies on how to foster stronger ties between academia and industry, which is important. Um, Again, I think this transdisciplinary work where uh, institutes like biocomplexity institutes can become the focal point because we are not in the business of direct day-to-day teaching at the, the university campus. But this is one place where industries can come in Mm -hmm. and essentially work with us jointly on a a problem of of great importance. Uh, If Mm -hmm. we done correctly, it probably can work. So I would say that uh, working with industries is a very positive thing for all of us to do. Mm -hmm. But quote unquote, the business models on both sides still needs some more effort in, in trying to figure out. The industries have to be more co- thoughtful about the IP. They, they're concerned that, they're also concerned that they cannot make the faculty members too directed. Faculty members, on the other hand, want to do more open research. They don't want to get stuck in one way. And they often feel the amount of funding that is available is relatively small for the contributions they make. It's not a study. So those are the issues. Um, when I was at Virginia Tech, people had set up other mechanisms where industries could partner with uh, with uh, universities. But I'm not sure they have been super successful thus far. People, I think, still searching for it. Okay, very good. Thank you. So you know, we hear a lot both in India, especially in India now, because AI is um, really everywhere on the news. Uh, so we hear keep hearing about the demand for are trained professionals and, you know, the AI workforce, this entire gamut across the data pipeline. Do you think academia is ready to train that AI workforce? Uh, are institutions, uh, do they have the capacity to uh, really meet the demand of industry and governments and agencies? Just uh, in terms of scale. Yeah, I think uh, you're not ready right now, to be very honest and blunt. Mm-hmm. Um, the, there's an ongoing and constant discussion in department here and other departments that I hear from my colleagues, that's part is hearsay, but I think it's true, is that the faculty-student ratio keeps rising. The CS faculty, I know for a fact, is under tremendous pressure under, in many, many schools because mm-hmm. the class size are growing. Many people want to take these courses now. Right. And um, they just are not able to handle it. And, and so you can see the departments have put out ads in terms of hiring, but um, that's not easy either. Be, uh, universities are also losing faculty members for all the reasons we talked about. Mm-hmm. So for instance, at UVA, our department size has grown, but not grown to the level that we would have ideally liked uh, to handle the level of interest that exists. Mm-hmm. Of course, there exists this bigger issue that you grow unbounded for a while and suddenly the the market drops and then you don't know you have other large departments. And that's something that, you know, not easy to predict. But I think that right now, most departments are struggling keeping up with the demand. Uh, We have people have classes. They have told me sometimes for introductory courses with thousand students sometimes. Mm -hmm. So in big schools. So those are very, very large numbers and it's very hard to keep up with it. Uh, some schools, including you, we have tried to do what they do with, uh, you know, using what's called academic general faculty. So faculty who specialize in teaching. It's a good good choice, but I think in the end, 
researchers need to participate in teaching as well if you want to impart interesting new uh, research uh, directions for the students. So yes, I think we are not ready. And this is a situation in the US where the, I would say the depth is much higher. In India, matters are, as I understand from my colleagues, Mm -hmm. uh, even worse. Now, IIT Madras has started an interesting program in data science. You might know about it. Mm -hmm. I heard about it from Mahesh, who is who was the dean for outreach then, where they are IIT JE is a is a highly selective process. Right. Uh, the data science program is a exact reverse, which means it's very democratic. Mm -hmm. Almost anybody with minimal background can join, but then they keep filtering. Mm -hmm. If you want to make it all the way to get the degree, but anybody can join that program if they mm -hmm. if they so feel, you know, some very minimal qualifications, I would say. Uh, I think that's a very interesting experiment. And I think we have seen over and over again that there are lots of talented folks who mm -hmm. potentially can take these online courses. That's a one right. way to scale out uh, and get trained. And I think online does, of, as a result, offer a very interesting possibility mm -hmm. to scale out, at least for places like India. Oh, wonderful. Uh, so just taking that question further, you've talked about, you know, our institutions ready and uh, clearly there's going to be challenges because students are really keen to uh, enroll in data science and AI courses. Uh, do you have any specific recommendations uh, for how programs in graduate degrees in AI, both in the US and India, can be improved, uh, both in terms of scaling uh, so attracting more students, training more students, and in terms of quality, uh, what should programs be looking at? Uh, a lot of AI requires hands-on experience with data. Uh, is that something uh, you see as a challenge when you have a thousand students in an introductory uh, class on machine learning? So do you have any sort of recommendations? Um, I think you um, can think of a couple of them. Let me start. Um, first of all, I think it's a really important question. One is, um, I think we do need to teach courses that have a, a healthy mix of theory and practice. Uh, if you only do AI with no un understanding of the mathematical background, uh, you can train a, a group of folks and there is a market for it. But I think in the long run, that's not the right way to do it. Vice versa, if you only engage in the mathematical side of it with no understanding of how to Know, play with the tools and the data, then the future is rather bleak for such mm -hmm. folks as well. So a combination is, is absolutely the key. Uh, technology offers a possibility in scale out terms. Uh, people have started to develop sort of virtual labs where people can play with it. Uh, this is one hopeful sign, unlike say doing work on, um, you know, with the pipette or things that are mm -hmm have this mm. hard reality in, in terms of mm. physical uh, elements here, you can use computers and clouds to potentially scale up. So mm. this is a possibility. And my colleagues back at Virginia Tech, other places, as well as UV are starting to work on innovative programs where they can use online methods to mm -hmm. scale out. And pandemics for all its problems has forced people to think about how to innovate in terms of you know using online methods. Uh, yeah. uh, so that's one. Second is, I think for uh, AI is growing so rapidly in terms of tools and techniques that I think actually we as teachers also need to learn and mm -hmm. be given time to learn. I, I think it would be uh, a false statement if any of us said that we know this area very, very well. Uh, in fact, we need to be very humble about it. We, don't, we know epsilon of the area in mm -hmm. some ways. It, you know, much needs to be learned. But what it means is that good courses that have multiple teachers teaching mm -hmm. is something that school should consider. So I've been an advocate of this to many places. I have not been super successful, but I can think of a course where two professors join together, one who has a strong background in say data aspect of it, one who is more of a theoretician and they teach the course jointly. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a meaningful way, not one where the first person teaches for six weeks gets mm -hmm. time off and they're done. It has to be really meshed mm -hmm. where the ideas are going back and forth. But such a course would be tremendously important for both professors too, in my opinion, they learn as well as students because they'll see aspects of being taught by, by trained professionals. So I think need, need to train the professors, but to teach the courses together mm -hmm. in some form. 
is a good idea. Now, again, online offers these micro courses that we have seen, you know, a short 10 minute course on this in a short, mm -hmm. that might be a good way to maybe supplement this, but I don't think so that that is a complete solution to the problem of having in-class teaching with this. And uh, my last point I'm thinking uh, is, and this is a more general issue, uh, Nandini, is mm -hmm. one where I think computational thinking mm -hmm. is broader than AI has to be introduced to students early on in their life. Mm -hmm. Its value goes way beyond AI itself. But I think if you want to train the workforce of the future, mm -hmm. we need to start much more early. And it will take 10 years, 12 years to see the results. So we have to be patient about it. But otherwise, it's it's a tall order to expect sudden change starting uh, either in a graduate school or second or third year of undergraduate. D don't have much time left. Mm -hmm. uh, so are starting to be reasonably well uh, equipped or uh, understanding of some basic computing. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember I'd never touched a computer till I went to IIT at all. Mm -hmm. I knew seen one. Um, it was so rare in India then. But I think now that's not the case. Mm -hmm. But I think, so good students are getting access, but I think it has to become much more pervasive inside mm -hmm. classrooms. But you already brought up, brought up this challenge, right? Even professors who are paid much better than a school teacher have, it's hard to retain professors right now as you compare with industry. So you can imagine the potential challenges that one would have in recruiting teachers in middle school and high school who are very strong in, in computing and data science because of the application. So, but the government needs to think about it meaningfully. And again, maybe uh, an online version is a possibility. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think so we should rule that part out. There might be a way to bring large groups mm -hmm. of folks in India and US by combining forces. You know, India has ways to offer basic courses in mathematics from India through these you know, there are lots of these tutoring programs, for instance, that can be harnessed in a meaningful mm -hmm. way, and vice versa. From here, mm -hmm. it's a super professors delivering good lectures mm -hmm. to the Indian counterparts. Uh, thank you. So that's a great segue. Uh, you've given me a segue to my next question. Uh, you look at the role of institutions, agencies. So you've got a funding from NSF. You know, we have the Department of Science and Technology here. What can U.S. and Indian agencies, institutions do in terms of uh, new initiatives, new investments, both in infrastructure and manpower to prepare this AI workforce? And also, how can we bring industry to be a meaningful partner uh, in sort of helping us accelerate, you know, the training efforts? Right. So I, this, again, uh, I've, I've given some thought. It's a hard, hard question in some yeah. form. Um, I do agree that significant investments are needed. Uh, um, at at every level, mm -hmm. uh, I did bring up investment even at this level of elementary, and middle, and high school because I think we all focus on colleges, but I think we lose our students. Many many students are lost before they even enter colleges. It's a little late, in my opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've been an advocate of strengthening school system if you want to get a good pipeline mm -hmm. and train workforce up. It's sometimes late. So I would say. A significant investment in strengthening the school system is a absolute mm -hmm. must, in my opinion. It seems hard, but that's where one should invest significantly. Uh, that would also mean that paying the teachers well, mm -hmm. but also importantly, Nandini, uh, we should once again embrace what was embraced all the time in Eastern philosophy, where teachers were respected and valued members of society. Mm -hmm. To be very blunt. Um, mm -hmm. It is not necessarily the case that teachers are viewed that way in India right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think till that fundamentally changes, often people don't need more money is my sense. They need a, a sense of respect mm -hmm. in, in the society. And I think we need to, I think we can do that. It was, it was actually integral part of a culture and we need to bring it back again. Mm -hmm. Teachers need to be valued members of the society in some form. So that's something that we can do. It doesn't cost that much. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing, of course, is in India, you sh one can think of building, you know, massive educational institutions. Government, of course, has been building out IITs, mm -hmm. but there has been now a push, and I think private sector is starting to see a role for itself in building 
high quality education institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and you folks know better, but from my standpoint and my interactions with folks, uh, the way I see it is early on, the private uh, sector put in a fair amount of money to build universities and colleges to give impart basic training. Uh, most of them did not have enough infrastructure to really sub do well beyond some point. I think the new set of private entities that are coming in uh, have potentially realized this, and I think they will be game changers if they continue this work. So, of course, Indian School of Business on the business side is a good example of what started very well. I don't know how they're doing, but it was a beautiful concept. Uh, Ashoka University and their mm -hmm. sister university, Plaksha, I think is another example where people have invested. I, I have interacted with them um, and I, I'm happy to help them as well as they go along. Um, some of my colleagues have started a new program called A-Grid, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, A-Grid, um, Shell, Shell Kumar and others have started. They have approached me. They, they want to establish a large university in India, uh, which is good. Nalanda is another one. I think we need these big institutions that complement the traditional role that government has played through IITs, ISCs, ISIs. All of us are largely products of these government schools, which have done very well. But I think private schools have a role to play, and I think they see a, see a value proposition. But uh, we should also think about how potentially we can train teachers and academicians for these places Mm -hmm. By working closely with the U.S., I can almost see a program where one could train lots of these teachers and institutions mm -hmm. um, by working closely with U.S. So that mm -hmm. there's a, you know, in the long run, there's a payoff. My understanding is almost all the first five IITs were established by this joint relationship with either right. U.S., U.K., and other Germany and other yeah. places. Right. I think there is a chance to do that again, uh, you know, meaningfully. And, you know, it can be done very well. Also, in this case, one can have private sector. I think India's IT sector has done really well for itself. So they have mm -hmm. a rather large role. In US, we have started establishing the AI centers, uh, mm -hmm. which I think is a, is a good, good idea. There are at least now, by my count, about 16 to 17 centers established. Mm -hmm. And they have come up with a call for another five. So those are very large investment, right? Each center is about $20 million. Mm -hmm. um, one sort of crazy idea is uh, these centers are funded either by NSF, mm -hmm. but now also by NIST, for instance, and um, DOD, DHS, mm -hmm. but also companies like Accenture had a role last time and another company had Google and Amazon had. One could think of Indian either private sectors or this program like the one you have mm -hmm. could potentially fund a center in US with the hope that they can start tackling some fundamental questions of Indian interest mm -hmm. where some aspect of work is done here, mm -hmm. but the center can define the role where aspects of it are done in India in their counterpart mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. so somewhat uh, far-fetched maybe, but maybe not. I mean, something out of the box in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. and the last idea that I can think of, and this is stems from my discussions with folks at NSF and other places, NSF has decided to go on the translational side with the new directorate that they want mm -hmm. to establish. I think that we are all focused, um, India and US, focused on establishing the schools and institutions in urban and metro regions. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a realization more and more so that one should establish these places in rural areas or I would call quote unquote backward areas in India as they're called. Now, mm -hmm. it's not easy to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think if you want to develop the workforce for the future, establishing everything in Pune and Mumbai and Bangalore mm -hmm. and Delhi is perhaps not the, not the right idea. My classmate, who is the founder of... Uh, company Zoho, I think so. Is, uh, yeah, he's, he's been in the news quite a bit. Quite a bit, yes. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, but Vembu actually has been embracing this idea of taking mm -hmm. his company back into the in the rural area that has been very successful from what I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, I, of course, know, don't know all the details, but I think it's a, it's a good experiment in, in a way, you know, to take this to smaller cities, rural mm -hmm. regions, rather than establishing 
all of this in, in large metros. Now, of course, how to uh, put people and bodies in terms of mm. trained profession is not easy. So mm. the challenge remains. But I still think that's something that U.S. needs to do too. I think that we end up ignoring uh, rural parts of America in the process. And I think uh, it's a cause of concern, in my opinion, in the long run. So mm-hmm. hopefully this is a problem that is not just uh, existent in India, but I think across the world, including U.S., where we don't want to create this divide between the urban and the rural sections mm-hmm. because it has got ramifications in the end that are not the best. So I think you've already touched, uh, you know, on sort of the U.S. and India connections and where you see parallels uh, in terms of the urban rural divide or, you know, sometimes the digital divide in terms of access and uh, infrastructure. Uh, So from our perspective, you know, as a binational entity, uh, what we're looking for is um, where are the opportunities for Indo-U.S. collaborations, especially in this sort of workforce and capacity building space? Uh, And what do you see as mechanisms uh, that can help us come together and also scale? Uh, Because I think uh, we have programs with good intentions. uh, We bring communities together and uh, then uh, the funding goes away and there's nothing that's sustained. So how can you think of, uh, do you have any recommendations? uh, How you see these partnerships between US and India uh, emerging? How do you uh, what mechanisms do you think would be most successful from your experience over the years with uh, sort of the U.S. side, both from industry and government? I think it's a, it's a very good question, first of all. Um, I think that uh, things have progressed enough that we can have genuinely good bilateral partnerships, mm-hmm. not where it's always viewed as U.S. helping India mm-hmm. or, or India doing basic things with services. I think that's, I think we have reached a stage where we can actually have meaningful, strong partnership. Partnership where both parties win, because at the end, if a partnership is in one direction, then it's Mm -hmm. not a sustainable partnership. So to that extent, I view that India has a huge market Mm -hmm. for US to look at, and they, of course, companies see it that way. But the huge market is in terms of talented workforce that mm-hmm. can be developed, as well as application areas too. Um, I think the impending climate crisis mm-hmm. uh, is going to affect everyone, but uh, India certainly has a huge uh, potential downside in, in, in this role. And I think um, we have a chance to jointly work with technologies mm-hmm. that uh, that can that can be then deployed to multiple parts of, of the world. You know, uh, for instance, people have said, you know, let's develop technology for uh, middle and low income countries. Mm-hmm. It turns out that that's a good way to think about it, but done well, it actually gets used in, in other places too. Um, but it certainly, what it does, it puts, uh, makes the technology cost conscious in some ways or makes it conscious of the fact that everybody can't use high-end stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think India is a good uh, laboratory for it because we have the diversity in terms mm-hmm. of you know, folks in every form of diversity so that good solutions that are being developed could, could be then deployed across the world. Again, Google, uh, my colleague Milind is working on public health, AI mm-hmm. for social good, which is a to- topic I want to bring up. So AI for social good is is a topic that I think both countries can work closely together, you know, in terms of health, Mm -hmm. uh, disaster resilience, which is Mm -hmm. a a big problem um, that uh, that both countries can can work together very meaningfully. As one example, we have just been funded by the NSF Mm -hmm. uh, and our counterparts at IISC and ISI have been funded by IISC. So we're working on, uh, so our group here at UVA Mm-hmm. IASC, ISI, Strand Genomics, mm-hmm. and Princeton University have been awarded this contract where we are going to work on three important topical areas in, in pandemic science, so biosurveillance, mm-hmm. uh, vaccination, and forecasting. Okay. So we just started that project. Um, it's not a super big project, but the idea is to grow this project. Mm-hmm. And it's a genuinely collaborative effort because I think we are going to focus on, on questions that are quintessentially questions of Indian uh, uh, sort of interest. 
So mm-hmm. variant, the question of you know new variants that might arise uh, mm-hmm. is a question. Uh, distributing or producing vaccines with your social limited resources are the question that India can and forecasting with the diversity we have and mm-hmm. data positive we have. Uh, but that's just one example. Mm-hmm. I have in the past advocated strongly and I'll continue to advocate it. Uh, when I was at Los Alamos, my colleagues and myself, um, Chris Barrett uh, really was a visionary there. Uh, after 9-11 events, they set up a center called NISAC, and it stands for National Infrastructure Simulation Analysis Capability. Mm-hmm. Uh, the realization was that we need a large scientific organization that can under, build advanced tools, AI-based tools, HPC-based tools, database tools, uh, to support decision-making mm-hmm. as it pertains to, to disasters. India has, of course, a national disaster agency, but that's operational now. Mm-hmm. I think there is a scientific side that uh, I have advocated. In fact, I've mm-hmm. met folks in India. There's a lot of interest. Mm-hmm. But as you said, Nandini, um, after I you know, talk to folks, we are not able to follow through. And mm-hmm. that I don't have a good answer. Maybe you can tell me how to do this well. Um, the follow through is, is a hard problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, Somehow it appears to me and correct me, mm-hmm. oftentimes the incentive is to start something, but not for you know complete it in, in a certain mm-hmm. I do not know what the reasons might be. Mm-hmm. So I think these two are topically ag is a third one I would bring up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, my feeling is that these are all topical areas where investment can be made from both countries, mm-hmm. significant amount. Um, we can have pro- programs that are you know have exchanges that are possible mm-hmm. uh, you know through scholarships like Fulbright Fulbright mm-hmm. was a great mechanism here mm-hmm. but it's not it's limited at the end to some extent one could easily imagine growing it multiple folds where mm-hmm. faculty members come back and forth uh, in both directions in a mm-hmm. meaningful way um, to, uh, to attract scientists in, in both places now both countries do have to manage their concerns with respect to IP and with respect mm-hmm. to security. But I think I would I think that this is a good time that you mm-hmm. know, given the the given the, the strong relationship the two democracies have, mm-hmm. it's a very good time to establish the the norms and, and grounds for establishing this relationship because I think both can find the benefit if done correctly. Uh, yeah, that's it's a perfect uh, summary of uh, Professor Marathe because I think uh, you're seeing conversations around the Quad uh, as well as, you know, the, the Prime Minister was in the U.S. recently. Uh, emerging technologies are, you know, big area and, of course, AI is front and center. So we're hoping with, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, dialogue happening at the government to government level, uh, we can see something uh, actionable and hopefully something that's sustainable. I mean, I think that's critical. Uh, and I hope, uh, you know, we'll have the opportunity to talk to you some more as we go along. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been a, a fascinating discussion. Uh, you've given us lots of food for thought. And, uh, you know, once we've uh, had our set of interviews, we'll compile and we may come back to you with some questions. I hope that's okay. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Thanks again for inviting me and thanks to your colleagues, Nishita and Sumit. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to, to if any, in any form that I can contribute, I stay um, passionate about the possibilities in India mm-hmm. and I stay passionate about you know, that day when the two countries can come together. I mean, uh, a person, I mean, there's a person bias, of course, to see the two yeah. countries do well. My home country and my adopted country in some form. Um, but there's so much to offer by both countries. And I think your initiative is, is is one of the fascinating ideas. And I wish you all the very best and look forward to working with you. And any ways I can help, I'll be happy to do that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Marathi. Thank you. Yeah, take care. Great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.